So, as far back as I can remember, I've always been pretty fascinated by epic tales. So, from Greek and Roman mythology to King Arthur and the Knights of the Round Table, I've just always been inspired by the heroic quest. And based on a little research and a lot of experience, I actually believe that we can learn a lot from the hero's journey about the entrepreneur's journey. And my own entrepreneurial journey began right here at Rice as an undergrad studying computer science. I can still remember when uh, Rice IT actually shut down my ethernet port because my online business I was trying to run off of a server in my dorm room was attracting so much uh, bandwidth that it was really shutting down campus-wide IT. <laughs> And it, it turns out that my business model really didn't work unless I had access to an unlimited supply of free bandwidth. So. <laughs> but you know, after some uh, learning experiences like that, uh, some false starts, I took the plunge the summer after my junior year at Rice. I turned down uh, an internship with Microsoft in order to join two other Rice computer science students to found or to co-found my first clean tech startup. And what happened after that can really only be described as an addiction. So since then, I've founded, launched, or joined as an early officer of five clean tech startups. Some have been pretty big successes, some maybe less than big successes, but they've all been really grand adventures, which is what I'm talking about today. Moreover, my entrepreneurial career really took me around the world. It's given me kind of a, a global perspective on entrepreneurship. And it's really interesting that despite many cultural differences in different countries, even in different places here in the United States, people tend to view the entrepreneurial process in much the same way. And especially with big stories like Instagram and the media recently, we're all familiar with this path. And I think you'll recognize it. It starts with you know, some kind of child prodigy with a brilliant technical idea, or alternatively, maybe it's, a, it's an MBA type who's conducted some keen analysis and found some hole in the market. But either way, they then go on to develop a beautiful, detailed business plan with lots of charts and graphs, pitch VCs, get lots of investment capital, um, you know, work really hard, maybe step on the toes of the other founders and cause some drama. Um, <laughs> but of course, at the end of the day, you have this hockey stick-like growth, and they ride off into the sunset with an IPO. Right, so that's, that's the way, right? That's the entrepreneurial process. Simple, straightforward, linear, beautiful, beautiful. Except that, with rare exception, that's not how entrepreneurship really happens. So for example, the average age of a first-time founder is 40 years old, not some kind of wunderkind child prodigy. Uh, similarly, ventures, successful ventures, that IPO, rarely look anything like the initial idea that led to the startup in the first place. Add to that, most startups will never even talk to a venture capitalist, and if you look at the Inc. 500 as examples of successful ventures that then became large companies, very few of them ever even had a business plan. And of course, the myth of the IPO, almost no one will ever actually IPO. So what's going on here? We have this model that everyone believes is right. It seems very simple, and yet it seldom corresponds with reality. But I believe that the entrepreneurial process actually does map to a model with which we're all intimately familiar. And so that's called the hero's journey, or the monomyth. So 60, 70 years ago, Joseph Campbell began analyzing thousands of myths and stories and fairy tales and folklore across many cultures around the world, across thousands of years of recorded history. And he was able to distill out a common formula that underlied basically every single one of these popular tales. And this is a, an oversimplification, but basically it follows this model. It starts with a call to adventure. Often the hero refuses the call at first, but eventually yeah, he gives in and takes the plunge. Usually there's the help of some kind of wise sage or wizard or some kind of supernatural aid that helps him along the journey through the dark forest. In the dark forest, he meets all kinds of challenges and temptations, and there's ultimately some kind of climactic moment where there's a death and, and rebirth of the hero. He reemerges transformed and finally capable of you know, conquering the greatest of the challenges that he faces. Then to complete the cycle, the hero returns to his homeland as master 
of both domains, the world whence he came and this underworld through which he's travailed. So how can this be? How can this be that over thousands of years and across all kinds of cultures, most of our popular stories would really follow the same pattern? Are, are humans just completely unoriginal? <laughs> uh, possible, I am, I am definitely. But psychologists would argue that this cycle, this pattern, really represents something much more personal for people. The path, the journey from the known into the unknown, or the conscious into the subconscious, even the rational into the emotional or irrational. So codified in these stories that we've been passing down for generations and generations are essentially instructions that teach us how to address our fears. So these cycles are so popular and so prevalent in our popular stories because they touch something very deep and innate about the fundamental human experience. And entrepreneurship, I'll contend, is a very fundamentally human experience. So it also starts with a call to adventure. But again, it's not often some kind of light bulb going off um, or, or impetus to, uh, to entrepreneurship. It's really a much deeper personal motivation for entrepreneurship. Entrepreneurs are extremely adept at finding mentors, advisors, investors who can act as the wise sage or give them the supernatural aid that they need. This is interesting because not only does this additional help kind of aid them in making it through the dark forest, often this provides the confidence that they need even to take the plunge in the first place. Now most of an entrepreneur's time is really spent <laughs> travailing through the dark forest, <laughs> for better or worse. Rapid iterations of a company in which you're gaining constant market feedback and trying to figure out how to make this venture work. And each of these cycles ends with a transformation in which entrepreneurs are either pivoting their business model, um, you know, adjusting and, and changing their target market, or in some way, shape, or form, adapting to the feedback they're receiving. But really good entrepreneurs don't only change the businesses they're working on, they also transform themselves, realizing that it takes different skill sets to lead companies through different phases. Then, hopefully, the entrepreneur has this kind of heroic return. Um, I chose specifically the Hunger Games for this slide because, much like Katniss and PETA, uh, pretty quickly after that initial success, most entrepreneurs find themselves back on the path of adventure pretty shortly after again. So, if you believe me that the entrepreneurial journey can kind of map to the hero's journey, then it begs the question, what can we learn from commonalities among the, kind of the most popular myths and stories and fairy tales and movies of our own time? I think there's some pretty interesting lessons. First is, although most stories tend to focus on a single protagonist, it really takes a team to accomplish heroic quests. So if we take Harry Potter for an example, Harry Potter would have literally died in every single one of his years <laughs> at Hogwarts if it weren't for his team. And teammates are important not only because they provide complementary skill sets, they fill gaps, provide you know, additional bandwidth, um, <laughs> extremely valuable to an entrepreneur, but also heroes tend to lean on their teammates for the strength to persevere during the darkest times of the journey. And so too do entrepreneurs. Across the gateway into the entrance of the temple uh, of the Oracle of Delphi is written a, a very simple phrase, know thyself. Um, so usually in the heroic journey, somewhere there's an epiphany of self-awareness that happens that the, the hero needs to advance to the next stage. And self-awareness is key for entrepreneurs as well. Not only because it helps them understand their own weaknesses, understand the things that they need in order to get something done, but also because self-awareness is absolutely crucial for effective teamwork. Now we've talked about mentors, and um, entrepreneurs who find mentors dramatically increase their success, uh, success rate simply by kind of tapping that knowledge. However, there are millions of people out there claiming to be experts or mentors in entrepreneurship, many of whom, I'll argue, have little or nothing to offer. So, the challenge is, how do you separate the wheat from the chaff? Well, it's no coincidence that the best wise sages 
in our most popular stories, our former heroes themselves, like Yoda, has been and will always be total badass. <laughs> so or mentors who have real entrepreneurial experience, there's been some great research done, they can actually attach a value to that experience. It's worth $186,000 to first-time entrepreneurs. It's extremely significant given the, uh, the other costs of starting up a venture. Now, as I mentioned, most of the entrepreneur's time is spent travailing through the dark forest. But effective entrepreneurs, just like effective heroes, they don't look at the paths that are available to them and choose the best or the least risky path. They create their own paths through or even over or around the forest. So often by controlling different elements that are available to them or even changing the rules of the game. Now this is a very different approach from what I'll call kind of the corporate approach. Uh, this involves having a, you know, a predefined goal, kind of a, we call it a fixed end, and then just lining up the means that you need to accomplish that end. That works really well when you've got a clearly defined problem, when you have an existing market, when you have a known solution space. However, that's not the, <laughs> that's not the environment in which entrepreneurs operate. They operate in an environment in which the solution space is not only unknown, it's unknowable. And so effective entrepreneurs actually take the opposite approach. They start with their existing means, who they are, whom they know, what they know, and they use those means actually to create new possible ends. So this requires a very different type of thinking. It's divergent rather than convergent. And effective entrepreneurs will use partnerships and leverage, embrace the many surprises that they will definitely find in the dark forest to expand their means. Expanded and augmented means mean additional new possibilities new paths through the dark forest. So another takeaway here is, I mean, think about how boring would the Harry Potter books have been if there were no Voldemort, right? You would have had this teenage boy, he hates Draco Malfoy, okay, he plays Quidditch, okay, every once in a while he goes after a, a girl, I mean, yawn. <laughs> <laughs> it takes a really villainous, evil villain to induce a really heroic hero. And so too with entrepreneurs. Entrepreneurs who go after really meaningful, significant, you know, world-changing problems have a much easier time attracting people, attracting resources, and even achieving fulfillment themselves. And finally, and this is, this is really interesting, um, most entrepreneurial success stories have some kind of moment, I call it the matrix moment, in which they can, they can identify a time in which time seemed to slow down and they could do no wrong. It seemed like everything they did was just destined for success. But what's interesting is that most of those times come immediately after periods that were the dark times. Times when the entrepreneur didn't know if he was going to be able to make payroll that week. Times when self-doubt was creeping in. So entrepreneurship has lots of ups and downs. But I'll submit to you that actually the most valuable asset an entrepreneur can have is not amazing ability to develop code, is not incredible financial acumen, but it's faith. It's belief. This is what gets the entrepreneur through the absolute deepest, darkest bowels of the forest. This is what sustains him through the death and rebirth process so he can emerge you know, invincible. But back to my story, right? Let's, let's get back to me. So I'm at this really interesting point in my career right now. I'm 33 years old. I've been practicing entrepreneurship you know, full time for the better part of 12 years. And all of a sudden, younger entrepreneurs are starting to come to me for advice. Like as if I'm some kind of wise sage, as if I know anything. Um, but that's, that's new to me. I'm used to being the warrior and I don't know anything about being a wizard. So this is you know, the new path through the dark forest for me. And one of the big challenges is how do I make this scale? Because it's, it's tough to make one-on-one -on -one interaction scale. So in an effort to reach out and serve a larger population of potential entrepreneurs, another entrepreneur and I recently started teaching a class at Rice called Launch. It's focused on <laughs> entrepreneurship. But here's the rub. You can't teach entrepreneurship in a classroom doesn't work. 
Entrepreneurship has to be developed experientially. And so, we've gone with a new model, one in which we actually are foisting the students out into the entrepreneurial journey themselves. Each student is launching an entrepreneurial venture over the course of the semester. Each student is failing, is learning from failure, is traversing the dark forest. And we're simply trying to guide that journey, kind of help out with that practice by providing kind of an augmented wise sage through ourselves and through an extended network of mentors and other entrepreneurs who can provide their own value through case studies, through advice, and through connections. It's too early to say whether or not this will be effective, but at the very least, within the span of about a little over three months, we will have launched seven new, exciting, impactful ventures. And I think that's pretty cool. But the point of a TED Talk is to share you know, ideas worth sharing. And so mine really distills down to maybe, maybe two sides of the same coin. The first is an appeal to potential entrepreneurs. When that call to adventure comes, answer it. I've seen the other side, and life is too precious and too short not to spend 100% of it doing something you really love, are really passionate about, and pursuing your dreams. And the other side is an appeal to existing entrepreneurs. I'm looking at some of you in the audience. Answer the call for mentorship. Right? Mentorship is so important to young entrepreneurs, not only because it helps them be more successful, but again, because often it gives them the confidence to take the plunge in the first place. And I think you'll find that you don't have to mentor entrepreneurs because you know, it's some service that you owe to the community. I think you'll find, as I have, that mentoring entrepreneurs is basically the same thing that got us into entrepreneurship in the first place, a whole other adventure. So wishing you all fantastic journeys yourselves. Thank you for your time.